welcome to the No Bad Day Show. The show is for women. I'm Jolene, your host, and every episode of the No Bad Day Show will give you a view into the life of another woman. Um, she will share her stories, her insights, the triumphs, the struggles, all the lessons that she's learned along her path. And my goal as your host is to bring you topics that are relevant and encouraging because I want you to be able to be inspired to be the hero of your own story. And that's why I introduce you to brave women. <laughs> They do hard things. They've been through hard things, and I love sharing their stories. So they are truly living out the No Bad Days motto in their current lives, and I want to share them with you. So today we are talking to Sarah. Pronounce your last name. It's please. Spear. Spear. Yeah. Okay. I, I know. It's a little. <laughs> you can use Martin. Martin. Both yeah. them, yeah. Married name. She just got yeah. married like a year yeah. and a half, a year ago. Yeah, no. It's two a year and a half ago. Yeah, about a year yeah. and a half ago. Awesome. Okay. Today we are talking to Sarah Spear, and she at a really young age. You grew up in Hollywood, right? Um, Santa Fe and LA. Okay. Mm -hmm. So right after high school, you just went right into the industry yeah. and movie, film, yeah. doing makeup yeah. and doing all that stuff. Gosh, you had a really big career I starting. Did. Didn't yeah, you? eighteen. Yeah, and even at that young age, you started a nonprofit yeah. in Africa. Yeah. So I want to hear a little bit more about that. And at the age of 21, you were really flying high. I doing sure was. Amazing <laughs> things. <laughs> and then I had a, we're learn a about real that. big crash. <laughs> you met a man who uh, I did. just kind high of. High school sweetheart. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Gosh. Um, but so that connection really led to. Yeah, my drug addiction. addiction. Yeah, it did. Yep. So I want to learn a lot about that. I want to learn more about you and what you're currently yeah. doing, of course. And the nonprofit yep. Daybreak, Daybreak that you work services, for. Yeah. yeah, so let's get right into it. Okay, let's do it. Yeah. So I look at you or should I look at them? Kind of both. Ooh, okay, perfect. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> it looks like we have one viewer right now. Okay, this <laughs> early. It might be Catherine. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Catherine, if that's you. Hi. <laughs> if not, hello, everybody. I hope you're jumping on. If you do, ask questions because at the end we will check on those. Perfect. So yeah, I actually just came from a radio interview, KXLY 920 on the morning. Mm -hmm. uh, my coworker, Catherine Reynolds, who was actually on your show yes. a couple weeks ago, we are talking about the need of Daybreak Youth Services. Um, if you're in Spokane, you might have seen the media, but our nonprofit is in need of help. Yes. Um, we serve the most vulnerable mm -hmm. of youth in the community, especially at our inpatient young girls who are addicted to substance use disorder mm -hmm. and mental health problems, including suicide ideations, and some of them have even been victims of sex trafficking. Yes. And so we are trying to make sure that we get the money that's needed to keep the doors open, and it has been a hectic week. So I love the title of your show, No Bad Days. Because yeah. <laughs> even on the bad days, yeah. you just keep going. Yes, you have yeah. to because it's wor they're worth it. And they totally and are. And Daybreak's been around for over 40 years, yeah. so it yeah. is worth it. And it so tell us a little bit about what's going on with Daybreak, and then yeah. we'll get into your story. Yeah, perfect. As well. So um, Daybreak Youth Services has been around for over 42 years. And a lot of people don't know that we're actually the largest, one of the largest youth uh, mental health and substance use disorder providers in the state. Mm -hmm. So sometimes people just think we're a small little inpatient facility on Cowley, but we're actually not. We're in Eastern and Western Washington. Mm -hmm. So we had a rapid expansion, not we, Daybreak, uh, in 2017 down in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. So it went from a 16 bed facility to a 56 bed facility. Wow, that's huge. Yeah, including the addition of uh, heavy psychiatric care, the evaluation treatment, which is acute care mm -hmm. for very um, high acuity level mental health mm -hmm. and kids who have tried to kill themselves. Wow. Uh, so it's almost like an emergency room department. So it's a whole different ball game of care. Yeah. So they had a hard time with that expansion. I mean, they needed to improve some of their trainings, their medication management. Um, and so there were some legitimate concerns on training and staff uh, readiness and some of the policies and procedures. And at the same time, there was some allegations down in Vancouver, which have been completely unfounded. And I want to make it really clear that no client has ever come forward with any allegation against a staff member. Mm -hmm. um, so it was very, very damaging to the community down there. Right. And separate from Spokane, but unfortunately the end result has been after a year and a half, again, this was a year and a half ago, our Spokane location is at risk of now closing because of the incidences that happened in Vancouver. 
And so Vancouver and Spokane are at risk of gouging. Yeah, the whole, the, the whole, whole organization. Wow. And so we serve a thousand kids across the state. So it's wow. vital. Wow. Yeah, and it's just simply not an option. And if you guys close your doors, where do kids go that have? That's exactly right. Nowhere. Yeah. Other than full emergency rooms yeah. that can't yeah. take kids anyways. Yeah. And I've heard some of my friends who've been in crisis with their kids, they Stay go to the, the emergency, emergency room, room for days. For days. Yeah. And if you leave, you go right back to the top of the list yeah. or bottom of the list, mm -hmm. I should say. And uh, and if you have a substance use disorder, you know, on top of a mental health issue. The hospitals are not equipped to deal. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're just not equipped to help people with mm -hmm. drug addiction. Mm -hmm. um, and so they don't have detox centers. It, it's, it's really a disaster. Our mental health and our substance use disorder treatment is, is just failing people across the board. But I have a lot of hope because I feel like as a society and as a community, we're starting to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And that's like that first step to change is acknowledging that there's a problem and being honest and vulnerable. It's hard, especially you don't want to tell people about your your struggles or your family members' struggles. But if we don't talk about it, people die in silence. And that's really what's happened. Well, and if they're not getting the help they need, they either end up on the street, which yeah. contributes to the, the homeless, homeless problem, problem, which we see every day in our city. Right. Or yeah. they're they're staying in an environment that could lead to suicide or sex trafficking yep. um, and ultimately lead to pregnancies, unwanted pregnancies. Yeah, we have a lot of young girls who are pregnant in daybreak. Mm -hmm. And so we provide sexual education and try mm -hmm. and help them. And if they're pregnant, make sure that they get their medical appointments and prenatal care. And um, But it really is, if we want to invest in anything, it should be our youth. Mm -hmm. because it stops that incarceration cycle, it stops the homeless cycle, it stops you know the poverty cycle, really has the opportunity to help build a bridge for these kids. And you've been on a tour and you hear us talk a lot about our goal in Spokane is to build transitional living. Because we actually have no youth uh, housing, transitional living in Spokane. We have a couple like temporary shelters, mm -hmm. but nothing long term. And so that's really what our goal at uh, Spokane Daybreak has been, is to be that bridge. And once our girls graduate from treatment, they'd be able to go into their uh, living with the supported services and school and still get that help and care they need mm -hmm. until they turn 18 and we can help them bridge into adulthood. Right. Gosh, I've, mm -hmm. I've seen the facility yeah. and, hey, thanks for watching. <laughs> the facility is... Uh, itself just it needs repairs oh, we need and a new building need so, a new bad. building so badly <laughs> but right now we're talking about surviving yeah yeah we're just getting this place yep. to keep going Absolutely. serving a thousand kids well, a year and we're sitting here in the valley our outpatient in the valley is actually co-ed it's for boys and girls and it's the only youth provider in the spokane valley for kids with substance use disorder wow. so not only is it going to affect you know our downtown mm -hmm. core but really we get girls from all over, but it's really gonna have impacts right here in the Valley as well. Mm -hmm. And then across the state. I mean, it's gonna, it's really, I cannot stress enough how disastrous it's gonna be if Daybreak does close. So um, we're looking, yeah, we're looking for help from the community and miracles happen and, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, so this service needs to stay. How soon do we need the five? By February. By February? Okay, so mm -hmm. Daybreak is looking to raise $500,000 <laughs> by February. I anybody feel like, has... <laughs> like we need a phone a thon. Exactly, so. Call in. Anybody has $500,000, <laughs> call me. But I like, know. anything like, helps. Yeah. I mean, honestly, and, I, and I'm just for a hopeful, we've actually already raised over $100,000. Yay. Yeah, so. <laughs> I, it's at, it's possible. It sounds like a really big number, and it is, but um, it's an even bigger need. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I, I have hope, mm -hmm. and if not, then you know I you'll learn about my story. I mean, there's redemption and healing, and you just don't know mm -hmm. what is supposed to happen. And so I have to also hold that in my heart that if we don't make it, something else will be born from it. Um, That's true. And so yeah. we just keep moving forward. I just you don't run and you don't hide and. Mm -hmm. I'm just taking it one day at a time. Yeah. And you have the right leadership. Yeah. So a great CEO. And yeah. we needed new leadership, mm -hmm. you know, and he's fantastic. He has over 35 years of experience mm -hmm. in acute health care, mm -hmm. running large hospitals across the country and in the Northwest mm -hmm. and really heavy um, mental health units as well. Yeah. And he's just, he's such a sweet man. Yeah. Good. 
it's very well, traumatizing and, for everybody. I know. <laughs> uh, they just literally found out about this, or maybe yeah. they've known a little bit longer, but as far yeah. as community, yeah, we found out yesterday yeah. through the Spokesman Review, wrote a big article on Daybreak and mm-hmm. what's going on, and, yeah. and it came as a shock to the community, so the community is trying to save Daybreak, and mm-hmm. we hope that if you're watching and you can share my post yesterday on Facebook on my personal mm-hmm. profile with others, and, and if you mm-hmm. feel called to give and donate, then click the Donate yeah. Now button, because Facebook has that little When we had a thing. really cute take, so I did a really sweet story last night, and it's mm-hmm. airing again this morning, okay. of a past client and her counselor. Okay. And so I'll post that video as well, Okay, that's a good one. Perfect. Yeah. Good. Okay. So. All right. Let's talk about you a little bit. <laughs> oh. The Everybody get ready. ready. <laughs> Just warning. I heard your story before too, yeah. but maybe you'll say, tell things I haven't heard. Oh. And so let's let's hear a little bit about your background because you came from LA area. Yeah. And yeah. Just, so I, I actually grew up in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and I come from a long lineage of women filmmakers. Okay. So my grandma is actually one of the first women to own and run her own production company in Los Angeles in the wow. 80s. Yeah, called Excalibur, and my mom worked for it. Oh, um, okay. So it was a family affair, and you know, I, uh, I was really born into, into film, and so I started working with my mom. She was a documentary ma- filmmaker when I was 15. Wow. So I've been working in film for I'm 31, so you know, 16 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so yeah, that's where I got my training was with her. Yeah. And then I started working with a really well-known photographer called named Tony Carlson. Okay. Um, and then from there, when I was 18, I got hired with the Coen Brothers. Okay. Um, yeah. So on, and my first project with them was No Country for Old Men. Okay. And it was amazing. And so I had just like this crazy like youth and young life and I also was in college at the same time when I was 14 um, studying sign language. I'm actually fluent in sign language oh, wow. when I graduated early. So I graduated right after my 16th birthday from high school. Wow. Uh, yeah. That's not that common back then. No. No, and there wasn't like running star, especially in New Mexico and Santa Fe. Uh, there was none of that stuff. I just, my mom, I was always hyperactive, so she put me in a sign language class. Uh-huh. She was like, oh, you can do something with your hands. Yeah. And my brain just picked it up right away. And so then, I, yeah, I got my degree uh, at the same time as I was in high school. I think your brain picks up a lot of things right away. You're a pretty brilliant girl. Oh, did you hear the picked up some bad things too? (laughs) Good and bad. I don't know how smart I am when people hear (laughs) some of my story. But um, yeah, so I I guess I should have the introduction. I did have um, a high school sweetheart Mm -hmm. uh, who I I always say it was like the good when the good girl meets the bad boy. Uh, and that really was my story. It really, I was so good. I mean, I just, I, I had a horrible experience with alcohol my first time. I actually ended up, I was slipped a date rape drug when I was 14. Wow. Um, and I ended my first party I ever went to, and I ended up in the hospital. Wow. And, and so I always kind of say, like, my drinking started with me close to death, and then it ends with me close to death. I mean, that's my story with substances. And so I remember waking up with the hospital lights, and my mom and my grandma were around me. And I had no idea what had happened. So I was really scared. When you were 14? Yeah, I was 14, wow. so I was really young. Hmm. Was first party, never, you know, I was so good. And and so after that, I was terrified. And I had a lot of addiction and mental health and with family members that were close to me. And so I've lost some cousins from suicide and, uh, and heavy addiction. So I was always really scared of alcohol and drugs, especially after that horrible experience at 14. Um, but then I fell in love with a boy and he was wild. So he had his own problems and, um, had, you know, dropped out of high school. And when you're young, you think you're Romeo and Juliet and you, you know, your brain's literally not developed. Right. (laughs) And so you believe it. Yes. And, uh, that's my story. You know, I met him and I was really good and he was really bad. And from a young age, I wanted to save him. Um, and little did I know that it would end up almost costing me my life many years later. So you were now in your, you know, young 20s in Hollywood yeah. doing your thing. Yeah, so at eight, Tell us about again, that. so I um, mm-hmm. was with the Con Brothers at 18, and then I was brought to L.A. Uh, to work with Josh Brolin and some other people, a really well-known special effects 
artist in their studio, and so I was working in film, and I had left Tyler. Mm -hmm. um, that was my ex. He had gone on the run. He was in and out of juvie when we were young. And then when we turned 18, he was in county jail. And so, uh, yeah, I left him to move to L.A., and when I left, he cut off his ankle bracelet and went on the run wow. and was actually put in prison. So when we had gotten engaged when I was 18 before I left L.A. and, you know, that big drama, my mom was horrified. Uh, so we had a break, and while he went to prison, I went to Hollywood. And then I um, worked in film, and I started traveling, and I was lucky. I traveled all over the world mm -hmm. when I was young, and it eventually brought me to Africa. Yeah. Um, and so I, one day, I remember I picked up a cup, and it said to be the change. It's gone, like be the change you wish to see in the world. And for some reason, that quote just hit me to my core when I, in that moment. Mm -hmm. And so I think we have these moments in life that are truly like transformational. And that was one for me. And I realized like, what am I actually doing with my life? Mm -hmm. And that's when I decided to go to Africa. And so I went through a volunteer program and I got there and I realized that the people weren't actually getting any of the funds. Wow. And so it was, it was uh -huh. one of those programs where you can go and you can teach English and it was wonderful. Mm -hmm. But the kids had no food, they had no sanitation, they had no bathroom, they had no books, all the books were in English and they speak Swahili. So I just, I met with the headmaster and the teachers and I was like, what do you guys actually need? So we created this nonprofit together and I came back to the United States and started to fundraise and I actually turned it into a volunteer program. So I brought young people with me back to Africa. Oh. And the youngest person <laughs> I brought was 15. <laughs> um, and I was 19 and 20 at the time. So I was young too. Yeah. Uh, and so I did that for two years. And I would say that was like one of my happiest times of my life because I was sober and I was of service. Right. And those are two really big things for me. And um, when I got back from Africa the last time, Tyler was getting out of prison. And again, it's like, I, I truly thought I needed to save him. And I need to make that clear because it sounds so crazy thinking about it now. But uh, I always felt a lot of guilt over that. And I think a lot of young girls do. I think we give our power away. And um, yeah, I decided to go back and get him. So I left uh, when I got home from LA. I got my little car and I, I drove to New Mexico. And my mom is so in tune. Like my mom is a very spiritual woman and she is my best friend and she did not like my ex, <laughs> to say the least. But I'll never forget, I was, it was a day, she didn't know why I was home. I had made up a story and I was at the prison picking him up and she started to frantically call me. And so I just was like, oh my God, I'm not, <laughs> she knows. Like, I don't know how she knows, but she knows. So I'm like, <laughs> decline, decline. And I listened to the voicemail and she didn't know, but she said, I don't know where you are, but I literally feel death around you. Like, I feel like you are going to die. And it just gave me the chills. Yeah. And I just, you know, so young and just like, it scared me. But um, yeah, I picked him up and. It just went so downhill so quick. I mean, oh my goodness, it was a disaster. I mean, I was so different. He was so different. You know, I'd been traveling the world and working in film, and he was in prison and had been put in solitary confinement. You know, so I come back like a bohemian, wild, free spirit of service person, and he came out just like such a hardened criminal. And, you know, he had a scar from his pelvic bone up to his... Uh, neck because he had had drugs cut out from him because he had smuggled drugs in in the hospital and they ruptured in his insides and you know he had the devil tattooed from his fingers to his neck um, and I remember thinking like oh god when you picked him up yeah, what was, was your shocking. spirit saying to you oh well I had drank a bottle of wine before you picked before him up. I picked him up and I even remember thinking that was strange. I mean, and, and I do have to put a little thing. I mean, I kind of skip over this part because uh, my story gets so crazy that I forget the, I forget the making of the story. Sometimes it's just like, oh my god, I went from nothing to something. But I had started to do some pills um, in while I was traveling and working in film and in Santa Barbara, and so that's important because I like to sometimes forget that. But you know, I had started to party and I had been introduced to like clonopin and Adderall. Okay. So that kind of had, that seed had been planted. Um, so yeah, I, I drank a bottle of wine and um, I remember thinking like that is probably not healthy, but I, I just was so nervous. And I know that was my spirit saying like, 
don't do it. It was my intuition, and I was like, I'm going to numb you out, and I'm not going to listen. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what I did. So we, I ended up um, moving in with him really quickly after in his dad's house because he was on the ankle bracelet. And it was amazing just, like, how quick I forgot about my passion and my dreams and my own life and how quickly it became about him. Was the drugs introduced right away or was that later on? No, I mean, really very, very soon after he got out of prison. So he actually had become a heroin addict in prison. Um, (laughs) How does that happen? There's a lot of drugs in prison. Okay. So people don't know that. But I mean, there are, you actually can get sometimes more drugs in prison than you can on the street. So again, if we want to talk about a really broken system, uh, our, our jail system is a nightmare. And it really, it's like, especially when you go in young, it just creates like even more criminalization of a person. And he was put in solitary confinement. And again, he's 19. Wow. He's 19 years old. That's a rewiring of the brain. It, yeah, to be in a cage. You know, and he yeah. needed, and he was troubled. Mm-hmm. Um, absolutely. But it made a situation that was bad, horrible. And so, and yeah, he smuggled drugs into prison. And, and so he had gotten addicted to heroin in prison and I didn't know that. And so, and I was naive. Um, so when he came out, he was doing Suboxone and people hear about Suboxone sometimes on the radio or on TV. It's, a, it's actually a maintenance assisted treatment program. So they give it to people who are coming off heroin. But what people don't know is it's an opioid the same as like heroin's an opioid except for it's a thin synthetic version but it's actually 40 times more powerful than morphine oh my goodness yeah Mm -hmm. and so um there's some benefits but there's some harms to it too so if you don't have an opioid tolerance you can abuse it and it didn't at the time this was 10 years ago like uh probation officers like there wasn't a lot of screening for it you had to have a special screening so you could use Suboxone to get away from your drug tests from not having an opioid come up. And so he wasn't prescribed it. So he started doing Suboxone and he actually uh, gave me Suboxone. And I remember being like a little bit scared and like, I don't know if I, he's like, you'll, you'll be fine, just try it. Uh, and so that was like the first thing I did with him was Suboxone actually, which was, uh, wow. yeah, which is used to help treat people from heroin but is also addictive in itself do you remember your first experience with it yeah i was very sick for three days horribly sick and i was like i'm not going to do that again and so that it scared me and then but it's amazing i feel like human beings have this ability to adapt and you really do become your environment and so that's what started to happen with him it's like everything that was horrifying and scary to me quickly became normalized And I remember the first time I found him shooting up. And that was another one of those moments in life where I thought, I need to run. And I remember being at a crossroads. It was like, I can go left or I can go right. And this like deep savior part of me was like, no, I'm gonna fix him. Again, I'm gonna fix him. I have obviously, I have issues from childhood of not being able to save certain people. Uh, And so that just manifests itself in in male relationships and uh an I, addiction to wanting to say like yeah. in itself yeah. it's an addiction it totally is and and really believing like you can mm-hmm. so yeah i found him shooting heroin and it was pretty shocking and just my story is a little crazy <laughs> I'm like, but i but i have to share my truth and right. that's just what it comes down to and i have no shame or stigma and part of my journey has been sharing it but quickly quickly after that I started to do pills again and, um, you know, was drinking. And then one night he came home and um, he shot me up with heroin. And so I had been drinking a lot and I was not in my right mind, but I, but I let him. I mean, that's just the reality. I let him and, and that night changed my life forever. Um, I'll never, I'll never forget that. And, you know, then I almost, again, there was a, a moment I was horrible I was sick I actually had a horrible experience with it it was so scary I did not like heroin that much at first um you just get really really sick like Like vomit oh like vomit and you're like shaking and you you're trying not to like um fade off 
So I was really scared I was going to die. I mean, it was very, very scary. Wow. Um, it's amazing to me how people want to do that again. It was the brain. That's oh, the I mean, that's so crazy. that's... So every substance you do... I've, I've studied neuroscience. I mean, it was part of my research, but not my whole research, so I'm not a neuroscientist. But it's your prefrontal cortex, and it's literally your patterns, your behaviors, and your memories. And it's dopamine and serotonin and GABA, like different drugs affect different chemicals in your brain and so it's the same thing as shopping and food and love addiction you know it's like I always tell people if you're into health yes mm -hmm. um when you first start a diet and you say I'm never gonna eat sugar again right I'm not gonna eat the cake <laughs> and then you eat the cake and you feel really guilty and you're like oh I shouldn't eat the cake and, and it makes you feel bit. not so good either and it makes you feel horrible yeah and then what do you do you you justify like okay I've already eaten the cake I might as well eat the whole cake <laughs> to get it out of the house right. and then you wake up and I'm not going to do that again and then a week later you're eating the cake it's the same cycle it's just with more intense substances that affect your brain differently so can I ask you a yeah. question so does it uh, actually alter neurological pathways yeah. permanently oh well so you have uh, neuroplasticity your brain can recover okay thank goodness um, mm -hmm. Meth is very, meth and uh, Xanax are very hard. So Xanax isn't that a that's a be, uh, uh, benzo, so it's not an opioid, and meth isn't an opioid. But those two are very those chemicals. It can take a lot longer for your brain to recover. Aren't people prescribed Xanax though mm -hmm. for depression mm -hmm. and anxiety? And it's 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 extremely detrimental long term to your brain and it can cause some serious addictions oh, if goodness. abused you know what i mean but even if not abused benzodiazepines um it can take nine months to fully detox off of benzodiazepine when i think i mean again with opioids and this is the thing that we're seeing with the opioid epidemic right now is people are a lot of people are prescribed them so you think like, oh, I'm prescribed this opioid pill, like it'll be fine, but you don't know your brain chemistry. And if you have trauma in your past or if you're genetically predisposed to addiction, um, it, you, you don't know what you're walking into. And so we've over-prescribed and we've prescribed for things that maybe are not appropriate for such a high level of an opioid. Um, but I also do believe in pain management because there are people who really need that medication for surgeries and their pain. Mm -hmm. But I think that's something that um, is really waking people up. Was like my doctor gave it to me. Right. Um, There's so much more information out there now and, and yeah. the stigma is being... Oh, take this <laughs> off. <laughs> There's becoming less of a stigma about it, yeah. thank goodness, because anyone can become addicted to it. Yeah. And it doesn't matter what background you come from. Mm -hmm. If you have addiction in your past or your genetic propensity for it. Yeah, you're predisposed. Yeah. I mean, and again, it's the brain. It's like we just, there's so much stigma and misunderstanding about it. And I know full well, like I remember the moment my, my brain changed. And it wasn't the first time I did heroin. I mean, that, I was horrified again. But it's like one more time. And, and I was so young. And I look back and it's like, God, Sarah, but you, can, you know, you can only do what you can do. But it was the second time, and he came home. He was like, I know you didn't really love heroin on its own, but I really think you should try cocaine and heroin mixed together. And that's called a speedball. Okay. Um, and that was the moment that I know my brain was hijacked. I, he shot me up with it, and I dropped my knees, and I, um, I threw up, and I just started to cry. I just sat there on the bathroom floor, next to the toilet sobbing and I just kept saying like I'm never gonna be okay I'm never gonna be okay because I knew I knew I had found something that was more powerful than anything anybody could ever imagine and from that one that one time I truly chased the high to my death and insanity I mean wow. that's amazing I was not rational I remember being rational and I remember losing rational thought I just wasn't me. I, I truly was not myself. Mm -hmm. I'm speechless. Yeah, no, it's horrible. This is so scary. I know it is. And I, and I don't want to scare people. Not everybody has to have as yeah. horrible of a story as I've had. I, you know, and, and mine was quick, thank God, but it was pretty brutal. And so I spent that next year and a half 
addicted to shooting heroin and cocaine. And I literally lost everything. Um, and I'll spare people the details of that year and a half, but it was every horrible thing you can imagine. Um, you know, I married him. And he robbed and stole and beat me and tried to kill me. It was horrible. Like, awful, awful, awful. Uh, and it ended up, I tried to actually take my own life, is how I eventually got out of it. Just doing... I tried to overdose, overdose. myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we had gone into a huge fight, and um, I finally just woke up. I had this moment where I was like, this is crazy, and I am sick, and I have literally lost and given up everything, and there's no way out. And I remember feeling like, I am never going to be okay again. Like, how, how do you even begin to recover from this? I was in a crack motel in Albuquerque, and he was, you know, dealing drugs, and I had lost everything, and I knew I was sick, and it was, it was horrifying. How much had you lost contact with your mom? A lot. So, actually, my mom had a lot of denial, and she owns that. Um, she thought I was going crazy, and she did not think I was doing heroin at first. I mean, I remember, like, I graduated early, top of my class, international nonprofit, Academy Award-winning films. Like, there was no way I was going to do heroin. It just wasn't even in her. She just, she hated him, and that made me then hate her because I truly believed, and my mom is my best friend, and she's like my guardian angel and is like the hero of my story, but I truly believed that she didn't want me to be happy. And, you know, when you're young, again, you're, you're young, and your brain is not developed, and you get so uh, focused, you can't see the bigger picture. And so... What can you tell us about... Us, or maybe women who are watching right now that have girls or boys too that are teenagers who aren't making rational decisions at times but maybe through the unrational mind not not fully developed frontal mm -hmm. <laughs> cortex yeah. how can we as parents come alongside them now or get them resources the yeah I, mean, I think the first thing is to not be in denial because I, and I think that's probably, I can't imagine I'm not a parent, but I know that for my mom, it took her a while to figure out how bad it was. So I think then the first thing is to acknowledge there's a problem and that it's okay that there's a problem. Um, the second thing is to realize like you're not dealing with a, a sane, rational person. So don't expect sane, rational choices. Um, because again, it's in your brain and it's not to like let them off the hook, but it's to be aware that you are not going to be able to solve it. Like, as a parent, it's probably a very helpless feeling. I know it was for my mom, and she wanted to fix me and solve me, but I needed a lot of help. And so what she did is she really became my champion and my care navigator and got me the services that I needed, and she never gave up on me. And this and was after the suicide attempt? Yes, this was after, and I'll, I'll tell... I wanted to talk about that. Yeah, but I want to go back really yeah. quick to the time when you were in addiction that year and a half and your mom yeah. was in denial yeah had she not been in denial and recognized what was going on what would you say oh. would be a good response at that moment for a parent to do to go in and grab you and say we're going to I mean that's school? kind of what she did okay that's that literally was the point it got to okay. it, you know oh. after I tried to kill myself okay. I still didn't want to be sober and it, and because again I was not rational and so she was like you don't have a choice did she have to go through the, the husband well so yeah we had to get an attorney and I had, uh, had to sign over a power of attorney um, but I was so I was so broken that I listened mm -hmm. and so I think if she had gotten me before that I don't know if I would have listened and that's part of the problem and honestly I'm here to say that like our drug and mental health treatment systems are broken and we don't fully know how to fix these things because there's a lack of funding, there's a lack of research. Um, but what I do know is empathy and um, walking bes beside, like right next to your child. And that is what my mom did. She just did not give up on me. Mm -hmm. She didn't give up on me. And she gave me and she told me I was okay. Because I think as a child, like you don't want to uh, make your parents sad. Right. You don't want to you disappoint, don't want to disappoint them. them. And when you're a perfectionist, you really don't want to disappoint them. You know what I mean? And you have this pressure to, 
to please and to show. And so it's like just to know that it's okay, that you're not okay. And to have that space, but to also have that firmness of like, I know you're not okay and we're going to help figure out how to get you okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's why we have professionals. And EMDR therapy for trauma mm-hmm. is huge. Like I am such a big fan of trauma-based therapy. Not a lot of people know about EMDR. Yeah. I would love for you to talk about so that. It's actually, so I did a lot of EMDR and it's rapid eye movement um, and it's, it's trained therapists who understand how trauma works in your body. And again, it rewires your brain. And so I had, I had a ton of EMDR because I had a lot of trauma. Um, you know, I had the, the incident when I was young, but I also had someone who brutally killed themselves in front of me when I was 16. I had horrible things in addiction. I had a lot of trauma that I just didn't talk about. And I think that was kind of the precursor, honestly some of that childhood stuff to how heavy my addiction went, how quickly it was under there. It was like brewing. And so those feelings buried alive don't really ever die. Oh no. And they get stored in your yeah. body yeah. and literally it's in our, it's in our cells and you have to have an avenue to get it out. Yes. So EMDR, I mean, yoga, meditation, prayer, even equine therapy. I mean, anything that's like going to rewire your brain. I mean, talk therapy is great, but they really kind of, the research is pointing towards trauma. Right. EMDR is interesting because you can take a memory and that will take you back to that memory and it could be really any memory. Mm -hmm. If you want to rewrite that memory in your brain and have that subconscious loop that's playing that trauma over and over again rewritten, EMDR is one of the best ways to do that. And there are people here, I know in Spokane, if you guys want references, I'm sure you have plenty of references of people who do that kind of trauma therapy. But um, even one of my children went through it and had great results with just an incident that happened at school. Exactly. And she felt so much better afterwards. I know. I know. I know another person that's done it though, and it was very traumatic and hard to get through. And she chose to stop doing it for a time mm-hmm. because it is very hard. It's it brings up. Oh, it brings it all up. Mm-hmm. And, and so that's the thing. It's like, and everybody is different. So it's like what worked for me might not work for somebody. Um, But that's where my mom was like, we're going to just figure it out. Like we're going to try different things. And so if you look at it as like an experiment, which sounds horrible, I wish that we had like the cure, but we really don't. Um, But you figure it out like, okay, let's try this. How does this work? Okay, maybe this doesn't work. Let's try this program. Let's try this service. And, And you can really start to kind of, figure it out. There's also like peer support specialists now. There's a lot of peer specialists, but I always recommend having someone who's certified or who has some training behind them because that can go either way if you don't. Um, But peer support, there's like recovery coaches that will work with parents. Um, And so that's also a good option because sometimes I think parents don't know what to do and they're entering into a world where they know nothing about. Mm -hmm. So getting a really good therapist or somebody to also help you um, I think is imperative because a parent, you you're not going to be able to fix. fix well, and the trauma of parenting someone who is going through addiction. Yes. My, my poor mother, your mom, and Catherine who oh, spoke about I know. not talking to her daughter for two years, yeah. not knowing where she was, not yeah. being able to call her, yeah. find her. No, my mom, she lost. I'll never forget when she would come to my sober living because I was in treatment for a year, uh, and I needed that. But they kept trying to check her in for eating disorder. <laughs> that's she had like, not she, funny. No, but it, I mean, it, I'm laughing because she had, she had thrashed her her thyroid and her and her cortisol and her hormones, and she had lost so much weight from the stress. Like they thought she would had a problem, and she didn't have that issue. I know some people do, and so it's really serious. But I mean, really, it's like I did a number on my mom. I mean, my mom found me dead. You've yes, heard my story. I want to hear about that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So my mom, after, again, her intuition, um, she had a feeling and she actually made my grandma. She was in a movie theater with my grandma and she said, I think Sarah's dead and we have to go get her. What? And my grandma's like, Carrie, you're crazy and you need to give her space. You need to let, she's an adult. She's married. And my mom's like, my daughter is 21. She's not an adult yet. Like she is acting like a child and I think she's gone crazy. Um, but she had started to do research on heroin like three days before because she did start to figure it out one of the last times I did see her I guess and I don't even remember and I uh, you know I was I had lost 25 30 pounds and 
had cut off all my hair and you know, I was in sweaters and it was the dead of summer and I threw up on the side of the road. I guess we went on a bike ride and it was just, I really don't remember it. And so she had gone home that night and was like, I think she's on heroin. And um, yeah, so she got up out of the movie theater, made my grandma get up and she came to the house where I was living and um, Tyler and I had gone into the worst fight we'd probably ever gotten into and he actually was threatening uh, to stab and kill me and he had come home with a bloody knife and I was hiding in the closet with my dog and he would just kept stabbing the, um, the, the divider with glass so there's broken glass everywhere he drove his motorcycle through the wall I mean it was horrible and he had left and that's when I tried to kill myself and so she found me unconscious in just the worst environment you can ever imagine oh I can't imagine seeing no. the broken glass the Possibly and there's the needles night. everywhere. The needles. It was horrible. Oh. Yep, so she got me to the hospital. And I went into, like, this... My body just started to shut down. I was okay. I mean, I was, like, conscious. And then all of a sudden, I slipped into, like, a very strange vegetable state coma. It's, like, almost like a vegetable state stroke-like coma. It's the only way I can describe it. So I declined quickly. And I ended up... My hands were curled like this. My jaw was to the side, I was drooling, I was in a diaper, in a wheelchair, I lost all mobility, I lost speech. Um, all I could do was like stare at her with really big eyes, of just like horror. And the worst thing is I was 100% aware. Oh, wow. I was 100% conscious, like as aware as I am right now. And so I started to get really worried because my family was there and everybody was talking really slow. Like, you're gonna, I mean, really slow. And I was like, I'm not okay. They were talking normal, but in your mind. No, were. they were talking like I was mentally um, oh, damaged. I see. I see. And really, um, I really was like, I'm gonna have permanent brain damage for the rest of my life. And I knew I was in trouble by the way everybody was acting around me. And, and they thought I was gonna die and I was in seizures, um, but I was married. And so this is where it got tricky. My ex husband started calling the hospital and telling them they couldn't treat me. And in New Mexico, when you're married, they have um, power of attorney over your health. Oh my goodness. And so my godmom was a lawyer and they were able to get me, um, to get my power of attorney away, like my rights. And they had a 5150 hold on me. And then my mom got me out of New Mexico and had me transferred to Arizona. Oh my gosh. Yep. So I think she, I've said wow and oh my gosh a million times in this interview. <laughs> so sorry for those of you guys who are listening and are annoyed by no, me, but this is amazing no, how your was, mom really went no, to she's bat my for you. champion. I mean, she knew. She was like, I've got to get her out of this state right now, or he's going to come get her and she's going to die. And so she, yeah, I was in a wheelchair and diapers. And we, she wheeled me through, and I had seizures on the plane. It was a 45-minute plane, and I was so angry at her in my mind. I was like, Mom, I'm dying. Like, what are we doing? Um, but we got to the hospital, and, you know, I just went into full-blown, like, full grand mal seizures by the time we got there. Like, full, like, flipping convulsions, um, you know, and I just watched my mom, and she held my hand with the whole thing and just... You know, that could make me cry. And she's like, you're not going to die. And she was just like screaming it at me. Like, you are not dying. It is not your time to die and you're going to fight. And so... Makes me want to cry. Yeah, I do. <laughs> I know. I know. But I, it's like, that. my mom's the one that gets me. But it's just oh. like seeing the horror in her eyes. Just terror. That's and what amazing. she has to watch me go through. You were even conscious of all that. Completely aware. So I did lose consciousness at the end after that large, large seizure. Um, and I regained consciousness uh, under an MRI machine. And again, like at that point, it had been like 48 hours since I had gone into this weird and I couldn't move like my hands were like this. And I remember waking up under the MRI machine and I all of a sudden could move my finger. And I thought I was dead. And then I realized after my finger, like, it was a big deal. I could move my finger. Mm -hmm. um, and so... They were scanning your brain? Because mm -hmm. they thought I was, had permanent brain damage, um, which I didn't, which was amazing. But I did have some horrible health consequences. So I found out in the hospital, I had already, I knew. But my mom didn't, that I had hepatitis C. 
Um, I had something very strange called superior mesonomic artery syndrome. I'd lost so much weight so quickly and my drug use, my arteries had like collapsed on top of themselves on my stomach. It's really very, very rare. Um, and then I had a contracted gallbladder. And so I was very sick. And um, yeah, my mom again was horrified. And she put me right into a rehab. I went into a rehab that was like half hospital, like the, the partial hospitalization program. And I detoxed straight for two weeks. Oh, that must have been horrible. horrible. And I was also doing a lot of Xanax at the time. So Xanax and heroin is the most deadly combination. Really, cocaine and heroin. Xan any mixture with heroin is usually how people die. Okay. And so I had to detox off Xanax, heroin, um, and cocaine all at once. And so it was it was brutal. My body was it was so sick. I just I couldn't walk for two weeks. I just would crawl on the ground. Um, so it was horrible. And they keep you fully conscious during all of this. Oh, yeah. I mean, they couldn't even... I wasn't on any medication. I, I couldn't. My body couldn't handle anything. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it was awful. Were you able to eat? Barely. I mean, liquids. I mean, and then... And then it's... I mean, the human body and the human spirit's amazing. You know, after two weeks, all of a sudden, I felt a little bit more human. And, you know, I participated in my rehab, but I don't remember much of it. And that's the other thing. Like, I always warn parents... Before you send your child to a 28 or 21 day rehab, to really be aware of what it is, because um, that alone is not going to fix them. And I think that we want quick fixes, but you know, 21, 28 day vacation somewhere is like the tip of the iceberg, and it's really that long term care program um, and that continuum of care is what is so important. So that for I just was in a fog. I was angry. I woke up angry. And I was traumatized. But my mom showed up to the rehab with divor divorce papers in hand wow. and was like, She's Awesome. I love you, your mom. <laughs> yeah. You're getting a divorce. How did she do that? <laughs> oh, she just sat me down. I mean, at that point, it was like, You're, just, you're done. <laughs> and I was like, Okay. I just was so sick of, I was so tired. You Can know, you make decisions. But I wanted to leave. I mean, again, so it's like for parents who are watching, I don't want anybody to think I went into rehab and then was like great and happy and was functioning and back to my normal self. Like I, I wasn't. And I called her and I wanted to leave every day. And she just would sit on the phone with me and say, just stay one more day. Just stay one more day. Like that's all I need you to do. Again, just one more day. It was, she just was like my constant cheerleader. And that's what I needed was like the cheerleader to say like, no, you can do this. And, and she would tell me like, Sarah, when you break a bone, it grows back stronger and that's going to be you. And you're not going to be live in shame. You're not going to be, a, you know, live in secrecy. You're going to tell your story and you're going to live in your truth and we're going to be okay. We're going to make it through this. And I just needed someone to tell me I was going to be okay. Right. Mm -hmm. And I needed someone to tell me I was going to be okay like 10 times a day. I needed to know I was going to be okay. I just didn't think I was going to be okay. Yeah. I think it's interesting too because Catherine was telling us about hey Catherine I know you're watching now <laughs> she was telling us about her daughter going to rehab and then coming out of that took a drink that same day yeah and she was in shock and yeah and it's just not an angry yeah and yeah. it's it's one of those things where it's um, gonna take a long period of time oh, and a lot of time. support and and I've noticed a theme too with a lot of people and I know um, people in my direct home yeah. who've had to hit rock bottom yeah. in order for a change to occur in their yeah. life. And um, sometimes they seek help and sometimes you need someone to come alongside That's you to give you yeah, the help. Right. And I needed someone to come alongside me. Mm -hmm. I did. At that point I needed, I needed someone to tell me how I couldn't, I didn't know how to live my life. I truly didn't. I didn't know what to do. Um, and even, and it was really hard for me because I was so together. And I was so high functioning at one point. I had this big, amazing, like from the outside, perfect life that you could only dream of to go from that to then as low as I went. Um, it was hard mentally, but I just, the more I just, I just started to surrender more and more. It was like my mantra was just like surrender, surrender, surrender. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, my mom was like, after we have like, you're not done. <laughs> you don't get to come home. Uh, and you get to now keep going on with your treatment. And by that point, I was like, I know my mom has my best interest. And so then I started to do the hard work after the rehab. It was really, I started to do the hard work of like, okay, I can't, I have to get away from this guy. He's going to kill me. 
and I have to find my self-worth again. And so I, you know, lived in sober livings and I went to so many different types of therapy and I got involved in the 12 step program, uh, you know, and I found my spirituality again, which was like a big part for me was having something higher than myself, like also run my life. And for a long time it was my mom. My mom was like my higher power and I needed her to help me. And then I found my own higher power and, um, you know, it was just a, it was a long journey. But And I remember, again, for anybody who was struggling with addiction or mental health, like, I remember right around two years sober calling my mom. And I felt I was so much better. I mean, oh my God, I was alive. I was, like, starting to get healthy. But I just didn't feel normal still in my head. Like, I just still... And again, benzodiazepine and opioids and that much drug use... Um, you know, but even alcohol, it's like it takes a long time for our brain to start to like even imbalance itself out. And I felt that. And so, you know, yeah, really a year and a half to two years, I just remember being like, am I ever going to feel normal? Like, feel better, but I don't feel normal. Mm-hmm. And that took time. And now took you feel time. Now I feel normal. Now you feel normal. I mean, I, sometimes. <laughs> 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 now I feel stressed, but <laughs> that's a lot of like quality problems. Um, yeah. But no, I feel normal and I function and, you know, and then went back to school that was really part of my my story was I I went through the system I saw how broken the system was in some places and so you know I have a bunch of different degrees including international political science with a focus on socioeconomic development Um, and I became an international drug treatment researcher and then also a degree in cultural anthropology the drug populations and then I got you know a couple coaching certifications and and I just loved school and I loved looking at the world system of drug treatment. Right. And so I know every type of treatment there is out there and what other countries have done and, you know, what has been more effective. But I can tell you, we don't know how to fix this yet. I know. It's not true, though, for a lot of things. Mm-hmm. Even weight loss, mm-hmm. for example. Mm-hmm. There is no clear-cut no. treatment no. for that either. And everyone is so individualized and yeah. different. And so that's what makes it such a hard thing. It's yeah. like, what's going to work for you because of X, Y, and Z yeah. drugs plus your chemistry and your genetics yeah. is not going to work for this person because yeah. they may have taken this, this, and this drug and their chemistry and genetics are yeah, different. Exactly. Yeah. But see, that's what excites me. Like, I love, I love the emerging research avenue of all of this, of health, of wellness, of addiction, of mental health. It's like, and the brain and our body chemistry, it's like the last frontier. I mean, it really, it's so underdeveloped and researched and I feel like we're starting to, and it's like with this mental health awareness, with the understanding of the brain, um, I'm so excited to see what comes, you know, and what comes from new research and comes from funding. And, um, yeah, I, I'm really excited because I think that there, there are some solutions out there that we haven't quite found. Okay. I have a question for you. Yeah. Uh, for women who are maybe at home popping a few pills yeah. or taking Xanax yeah. or maybe even drinking a little yeah. bit more in excess at night, yeah. um, what, what advice would you have for them? Well, first, it's like not living the shame of it. I mean, shame truly does kill us. I mean, it just kills you. It kills you. It kills you. Uh, you're not alone. Uh, I can't tell you how many women who are like successful and high powered and normal I know it's like we have stigmas of addiction and people are always like I never think you're a heroin addict but um call me and tell me they have a problem and so I love the idea of like finding someone that you can be completely honest with and I think that's a really big a really big component and so I am a big fan of like recovery coaches and peer support specialists and having someone that can just be in your corner and I think that I, that would almost be my recommendation right now because I, it's sometimes scary to come out to your friends and, and not everybody, just because you're abusing some pills, like doesn't necessarily mean that you are a hardcore addict and you need to go to an inpatient facility. It's like, again, it's just like weight loss. Everybody's different and there's different levels and different varieties. And sometimes you're using those pills to cope with life and, you know, it's like that's where therapy and um, you know some EMDR and figuring out what is that underlying reason is huge. But you can't get to the underlying reason if you don't start to get honest and break the shame about it. That's so important. Yes, yeah. to just start with possibly therapy and see that and telling your therapist. Yeah, right. you know what I mean. Being yeah, that's like the key because I know a lot of people go to therapy and they just are like, "Fix me." 
<laughs> but I'm not going to totally tell you <laughs> what's going on. And so like, that's why I don't, I don't care if it's a recovery coach or a mental health therapist or an EMDR therapist. Like if you can talk about what's actually going on and it's like taking that real step into vulnerability and taking off the mask and saying, I'm not okay. I'm using pills. You know, I'm, I'm abusing my medication. I'm drinking too much. Then that's the first step to help and health and healing yeah. um and i also like i love 12-step programs they're free and there's a lot of stigma around those too but you can walk into like a women's meeting and um find other women who are exactly like you right. and have instant connection it's absolutely horrifying that first time um but there are 12-step groups that people can join and it's free and there's no judgment and yeah, check with your local church. Yeah. Um, also, people who are like mothers who are dealing with people who have drug addiction or your spouse, and yeah. you, there's Al-Anon or exactly. people to get help there. Yeah. Are there other resources for support in that direction? Yeah, that's where I'd like a 12-step, so Narcotics Anonymous mm-hmm. or Alcoholics Anonymous, and you can Google it. Um, there's Celebrate Recovery. I mean, there's so many different things, but for women... There's something about being with other women, mm-hmm. and so I really recommend that. I really recommend sticking with women's meetings. Is um, there support like that here in Spokane? Yeah, there is. Oh. So all you have to do is just Google, um, you know, women's meetings in Spokane, mm-hmm. and let, you you don't call, you just show up, and it's it's scary, but you show up, and some meetings are great, some are horrible, um, <laughs> you know, and I and. And, and you can find recovery coaches. Again, I, it's like that is a paid service most of the time or a therapist, but you just need a cheerleader. You need someone who you can be honest with, who's not going to judge you, but that you can start to learn how to be honest because so much of addiction is shame-based. Your personal story is incredible and seems to be part of your passionate daybreak. Some people have asked about what, hold on, I will see more here. What management at daybreak has done to help save the organization during this difficult time? How are those you work with passionate about the work you do okay that's a good question um so i think that's really important coming back to daybreak the management a lot of people at daybreak have stories like mine or like Catherine's, who you all learn who are mothers or who are in recovery themselves and so it's truly it's like that heart and soul is, is there and i think that needs to be there for nonprofits. it's like the mission is the most important if you can get behind and believe in that mission, um, then it kind of drives everything else. So with our new CEO and the changes that we've made bridging the organizations, it's it's really been amazing to be a part of. Right. Mm-hmm. I know. So, um, my son, Roderick, has gone to Daybreak and spoke to the girls. Yeah. He's gone to the outpatient facility here in the Valley and spoke with the co-ed group. Yeah. And it's really just a, an awesome organization. I can't tell you guys enough about what they do. I, mm-hmm. My first tour there... I saw a 13 year old girl just being pulled off the streets from sex trafficking and how traumatized she was. Mm-hmm. And at that time you didn't have the mental side of the mm-hmm. facility. You just had the, you just had the, yeah. 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 And, uh, and being intermixed with those mm-hmm. other girls too, it's, it's good that there's this yeah, divide now. Separate. People can come in for yeah. the mental treatment yeah. and then they have the addiction yeah. side. Um, but it's changed my view on a lot of things in that regard and yeah. so I'm such a big fan of daybreak yeah I am too I mean that's why I'm there I wouldn't I wouldn't be there if I if I didn't believe in it I truly wouldn't be there oh well with your credentials yeah. and all the things you could be doing yeah that says a lot about being there yeah and I'm, I believe in, and I believe in the mission and, and the services and I'm excited because we're just starting it's like if we can make it through this um like the end it's like endless possibilities so it's like I know I know it's been around for 42 years it's gone through a lot of changes but uh, the vision forward is pretty exciting yeah and in May we have the make May amazing event yes. on it's May like 9th fun factor <laughs> yay <laughs> because you and Catherine are on the mm-hmm. committee that works on yep. giving fun to the girls that are there yeah. so they can have uh, enrichment activities that allow them to get really out engage. of the facility yeah. too yeah, yeah. And, and and get access to experiences that they would never have and alternative therapeutic approaches like equine therapy and art therapy music therapy it's things that insurance doesn't cover that are so beneficial 
um, and mentorship, you know, your son coming in and we bring other community members in. Um, so it's pretty, it's amazing. And Catherine is really the mastermind behind that program. And we have over 42 community partners in Spokane. Yeah. So. And Wendy Lee says you are amazing. Congratulations oh, on your you. recovery. Thank you so much. I'll have, yeah, and I'll have 10 years. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yep. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. No, I, yeah, so I have 10 years. I have over 10 years. Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, and I've had, I also, a health update. I've had a full healing. I no longer have hepatitis C. <laughs> and so I've, I've really, I mean, I've had That's so awesome. many miracles, which is why I believe, I believe in hope and healing. Right. I really do. Wow. I said wow again. <laughs> You're so funny. <laughs> I am so funny. I just like I don't. I always tell like parts of my story, um, so it's yeah. fun to sit down and it's good for me to remember. I mean, it's 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 amazing. I'm really one of the one percent, so I, and I know how blessed I am. When is the book coming? I've always wanted to write. When I've just been a little busy with daybreak, I've <laughs> <laughs> yeah. been a little busy, but it's in it's in the back of my mind. <laughs> for now, we'll stick with podcasting. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Getting your story out that uh, way and saving daybreak. And saving daybreak. <laughs> like yeah. my first my first mission. Five hundred thousand by February. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> Does anybody else have any more questions? Um, and I also just want to put a plug out there that. If anybody does need help or you have a child or somebody or you yourself are struggling, I, I have an open door policy and you can call me for free and talk with me and I can help point you in connections and directions. Um, and I know Catherine has talked to people and, and I am there too to help guide guide women on and, and where you need to be. So we can put you in contact with people that can help. Completely controversial. Uh <laughs> that too. You know what I mean. <laughs> what am I trying Confidential. To Confidential. Oh yeah. I'm like my whole life. Controversial. And <laughs> yeah, exactly. I've got both, and my whole life is about confidentiality. Yes, that is like my key thing. So yeah, and I don't work with people one on one. I am a recovery coach, but I do system level things. But I can get. I can just be a sounding board and get people in contact with just some people pointing in the right yeah. direction. Yeah. Okay. So when you said recovery coach, I didn't quite know what that meant. Yeah, so actually, I don't know, Catherine's a recovery coach too. We're both certified. And so it's a new emerging field um, of people who have been through addiction or um, maybe had a family member. And it's a certification where you are a certified recovery coach to work with families or individuals okay. on their um, addiction issues and help just really it's like just like a wellness coach you're there to help coach them through and help guide them on their path and it's different than therapy because it's truly just somebody there to be like i am your cheerleader and i'm in your corner and the answers are within you and they just help bring those out and figure out uh, what's best for you when you sometimes can't see it right so how do they get a hold of you um, so can, well, I think the best way, well, gosh, I'm not that active on social media right now, but mm -hmm. uh, Sarah Ashley Martin on Facebook is probably the best way to get a hold of me, and they can just send me a little, uh, you know, message, or honestly, they can get a hold of me through Daybreak, and my email is sphere, S-P-I-E-R, at daybreakyouthservices.org. Um, I'm on that email 24-7. In fact, uh, let's see, where can people donate? You can donate at daybreakyouthservices.org and make sure to go to the upper right part of our website to donate. Um, or you can send a check to 960 East 3rd Avenue, 99202. Or you can call our administrative office um, if you just Google Daybreak Administration Office and you can ask for Aaron. Um, and we are a nonprofit, so it is tax deductible. We're a 501c3. And um, I just, I'm so inspired by Spokane right now and by the community that is rallying. Um, it's pretty amazing and the money that we've brought in and the support and um, we do do tours. Yes. And so Catherine and I do them together and we actually have the girls. Uh, it's uh, a part of their phase up. So if they're in a higher phase, they get to be selected to do the tour and they love it. It's, it's so cute and so they'll actually leave the tour with us and they get to share their story whatever they want or don't want um, nothing is scripted <laughs> nothing is scripted and 
it's pretty amazing and it gives these girls an opportunity to interact with the community and not live in shame and stigma and they're so scared at first and then it's like by the end of the tour they're so proud of um of themselves and their treatment so it's a really remarkable experience so i highly recommend somebody to come on a tour yes i do too yeah yeah i got to go on one uh, about a month ago and then the girl was graduating the next week so yeah. i went back and watched her graduation and that was really cool i know the closing ceremonies are amazing yeah and the redemption in the story yeah. that she had even I know. And she that was her second time there, yeah. I believe. And yeah. she was reuniting with her grandmother and her grandmother had forgiven. Oh, and, and her family was yeah. so cute. That was a happy one. That was like a happy closing ceremony where you feel mm-hmm. really good about where she's going. Yes. You know, and I think that's important real quick because I know we're done. But like relapse, sometimes it hasn't been part of my story uh, because I truly know if I was to do drugs, I'd die. Uh, and I don't want to die today. But for a lot of people, that is part of it. And so that's, again, it's, it's okay. It's like relapse is okay. And it's just like somebody who's diabetic. I mean, there's episodes. And, and again, that's where you step in and you figure out, like, okay, what wasn't working and what's going to work. Mm-hmm. Right. And for young ch- girls and boys who are oh, going through young, it's so this hard. The, oh, yeah. It's got to be really yeah. hard. You're going through life and wanting to live life. And what and does that mean? And feel normal and yeah. party with your friends. And, yeah, getting sober young was hard. Mm-hmm. But I'm so glad I did it now, you know. Well, yeah. And yeah. you would have died. So. Yeah, I had no choice. I mean, for me, there was just no choice. There's <laughs> no option. Yeah, the will one way. <laughs> yeah, the will to live and you knew what your purpose and was. And I knew what had. So, yeah. And I still know what my purpose is. Yeah. Well, thank you for being on the show today. Oh, I know you're so busy. Oh, no, I appreciate you. I love you. I appreciate you. I love that you're creating this space for all these women. It's pretty special. I can't watch it and see what's good. So, yes. Thank you. All right.